and welcome to this webinar on how to address penetration testing and uh, vulnerability uh, vulnerabilities and adding the verification measures that NYDFS says you need to be thinking about. I'm Alan Calder. I'm your host for this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, talking about this particular aspect of NYDFS. For those of you who haven't been on any of our webinars before. My own background is in cybersecurity over some 15 years or so. The uh, first book I wrote on the subject of data security or cybersecurity, as we now call it, uh, is in its sixth edition. It's IT Governance and International Guide to Data Security in the International Standard ISO 27001. Uh, it's, uh, an, it's a postgraduate textbook in a number of universities. Uh, and the company which I founded, IT Governance, has gone on to become one of the, if not the leading global provider of products and services around uh, information security and uh, cyber compliance. We focus on making sure that all of the products and services that we develop uh, are capable of being interchangeable in ways that enable organizations to address their issues and challenges in ways that suit them. We have a team of trainers and consultants who work directly with clients to help them address issues. Uh, we keep our trainers and consultants focused on putting together the best possible results for uh, clients. And we've worked with clients and organizations all over the size in the United States. Those include organizations like Wells Fargo, uh, NASA, Deloitte, uh, the Western Union, Equifax, uh, the Bank of New York, and, uh, and others. We're going to be talking today about penetration testing about vulnerability assessments and monitoring vulnerabilities. They're two different parts of the cybersecurity agenda. And we're going to be talking about uh, how to deal with the need to train staff and how to monitor and ensure that staff training controls, employee training controls are effective. In all the webinars, designed to run for about 45 minutes. The uh, the bit with just me speaking is probably 35 minutes or so. Uh, at the end of it, there is an opportunity to ask questions. But you may well find that you have questions which come up during the period of the webinar. Please do use the uh, question function in the GoToWebinar panel, which you should have on your uh, screen. You should be able to type a question into the panel and if you then uh, press send, uh, when we come to the end of the webinar, I'll pick up all of the uh, questions and I'll read them out, I'll share them with you, and then I'll give you uh, the answer to the, uh, the questions. Any questions you've got, please do. Typically, the first question tends to be, uh, are we making a recording of this uh, webinar? Can that recording be sent out to uh, everybody? And the answer is uh, yes, the slides will be available to uh, people who've uh, registered for this webinar. They'll be made available something uh, in something like the next two to three uh, business days. So let's move into the uh, subject matter itself. Uh, what are the requirements, the NYDFS requirements uh, in terms of penetration testing and vulnerability? Why on earth we're paying attention to them? Uh, and the answer is that the compliance deadline, the one-year compliance deadline uh, for section 500.05 uh, says that um, uh, financial sector organizations caught by the regulation have to have penetration testing and vulnerability assessment uh, processes in place as part of their cybersecurity program. Uh, they have to be there within one year of the uh, passage into law of NYDFS. You only have to report on it a bit later than one year, but uh, nevertheless, the reality is that penetration testing is a fundamental part of ensuring that the uh, entity's uh, external facing defenses and its internal infrastructure are secure against breach. Uh, most uh, breaches uh, nowadays come about through inadequate security uh, on the perimeter, through uh, undealt with vulnerabilities, or through weaknesses in human beings, the uh, key attack vectors. And so the second area we'll be talking about is training and monitoring uh, as part of the incident response plan, uh, as part of the one-year set of uh, requirements you need to have in place a training and monitoring activity, which uh, um, has to then extend into the 18-month reporting deadline. So we'll look at a bit of training and monitoring and the requirements around that. Turning first 
just to the reality. Why does uh, the NYDFS require this kind of level of cybersecurity uh, program? And it's worthwhile looking at the financial industry uh, security uh, position. So the uh, financial sector uh, vulnerabilities put together the financial sector uh, scorecard uh, looking at the 7,000 financial services of companies that are assessed by the scorecard when you get the slides you'll be able to take, click through and look at the uh, detail uh, yourself um, of those 7,000 companies at least 1,000 nearly 1,400 had at least one unpatched vulnerability and vulnerabilities in case you didn't know this are all uh, codified they are listed in a uh, commonly accessible uh, worldwide database it's hosted by the uh, the um, by NIST uh, and it's called the CVE database uh, and you can look at the CVE database you the good guys and the bad guys and see exactly what the most common vulnerabilities are um, and uh, as I said 1356 uh, of 7111 financial services companies had at least one commonly known and identified vulnerability. 72% of those companies were vulnerable to Poodle. Poodle is the nickname given to a 2014 vulnerability, which has the uh, registration CVE 2014-3566. 38% 3, of them were vulnerable to uh, were, were, had, a, had a vulnerability which was identified in 2016. That's 2016 0800, commonly known as uh, as drown and only 23% were vulnerable to uh, freak which is a 2015 vulnerability quite a lot therefore of those organizations as you can see had more than one uh, vulnerability even if you just add up those percentages they come to more than 100% so many of those financial sector companies had more than one of the known vulnerabilities and if you have a look at the uh, areas in which the uh, organizations had exposures. You can look across this graph. Um, the financial sector average, you can see the financial sector average for uh, endpoint security, 96% uh, of organizations had endpoint security breaches. Uh, the uh, financial sector performance is just uh, just a fraction under the uh, the overall uh, the overall average. So the financial sector is not different from most other sectors. In some, as some areas, it's uh, slightly less bad. In one or two areas, it's slightly worse than uh, the average of all other sectors. So in some ways, you can draw comfort from the fact that you're, broadly speaking, no better and no worse than all other sectors. On the other hand, uh, what it means is that hackers don't have to discriminate very much. They don't have to think terribly hard about uh, staying away from the financial sector because it's kind of hard to break into organizations in the financial sector because actually uh, it's about as easy to get into the financial sector as it is to get into uh, any other organization uh, and the financial sector typically has got much more useful and valuable either data or of course uh, money and access to accounts and systems that involve money. So the financial sector uh, has a lot of vulnerabilities. The slide tells you exactly why uh, it could just be an issue, something that you need to deal with. NYDFS says the uh, cybersecurity program has to uh, include monitoring and testing of uh, vulnerabilities. The basis on which you put together your uh, monitoring and testing plan is driven by your uh, risk assessment. If you were able to join us uh, at the, for our last webinar, we looked at risk assessment methodologies and risk assessment tools. You can download previous webinars from itgovernanceusa.com. So if you want to go back and have a look at uh, our guidance around risk assessment, there is a webinar on uh, risk assessment there that you can, uh, you can look at. Risk assessment is the process of identifying the uh, vulnerabilities you've got to deal with, the uh, impacts on the organization, uh, and the likelihood if a particular threat exploits a known vulnerability. And what uh, NYDFS says is that having identified where you may have vulnerabilities, you should be uh, continuously monitoring them. Uh, you should put in place mechanisms for 
uh, identifying changes in your vulnerability posture uh, and you need to be doing as a minimum annual penetration testing uh, on the basis of the risks that you've identified. And so your risks, your risk assessment will identify infrastructure, it will identify hardware operating systems, uh, applications, it will look at the range of possible vulnerabilities that you could have and that will drive the targets for your annual penetration testing uh, and it will drive targeting of biannual vulnerability assessments. And a vulnerability assessment is simply an automated scan of an internet facing uh, IP address or asset to make sure that uh, newly discovered vulnerabilities and scanning services, uh, part of their role is updating for newly discovered vulnerabilities, is scanning to make sure that any vulnerabilities you've got have been identified so that you can uh, remediate. So your risk assessment drives the targeting around what you should be looking at, uh, is going to uh, give you some proportionality based on the impact to the entity if there is a breach. So you, you may have some applications where if they're breached, it'll make no difference to the organization at all. And so you're not gonna do very much around scanning and protecting those, but there will be other uh, uh, systems, other databases where you're holding or processing significant amounts of non-public uh, valuable uh, data uh, and you'll need to be protecting those. Of course, where you have an intersection with the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, if you're providing services into the, uh, into the European Union, uh, then you've got to be doing this from a GDPR compliance point of view as well. So the single program of testing and vulnerability assessment can enable you to meet both NYDFS and, uh, and GDPR reporting crimes. Of course, there's the added benefit that if you don't have uh, vulnerabilities, if there's nothing that hackers can do to get into the system, you don't find yourself having to report a data breach. So that gives you uh, a chance of staying out of the clutches of having to report data breaches under the uh, New York Data Breach Reporting Regulations. A recent survey carried out by Poneman, uh, the Poneman survey looking specifically at NYDFS entities, organizations that have to uh, up comply with NYDFS. 69% uh, of respondents to the survey said the most difficult part of meeting the NYDFS cybersecurity requirements was in fact the requirement to conduct annual penetration tests and implement continuous uh, monitoring. And you can see the range of areas in which organizations were having problems. Uh, deploying multi-factor authentication, only 60% of organizations had problems there. Uh, data encryption, a bit more, but certainly penetration testing involved vulnerability monitoring the highest level of, uh, uh, of difficulty. And that really shouldn't be because in actual fact, uh, deploying effective penetration testing and vulnerability monitoring services should be very straightforward. Yes, there's an element of uh, money involved in it, but part of the point of turning to a professional uh, penetration testing company is they should be able to deliver a service which is NYDFS compliant without you needing to spend an awful lot of time uh, and technical effort uh, um, uh, helping them put together what you need. And so uh, the reality is that it should be one of the easiest things for you to do rather than one of the uh, hardest. What is a penetration test? A penetration test, sometimes called a pen test, it's an authorized attack on a computer system, uh, authorized because uh, you will have said to the penetration testing company, yes, go ahead and do this. Uh, and typically the, um, uh, the authorization will include an agreement by the testing company that their testing won't damage any uh, systems that where they find uh, vulnerabilities they won't exploit them to the destruction of systems or the exposure of data that uh, there are protocols around alerting you to high level vulnerabilities as fast as possible but penetration testing is an authorized attack by an appropriately qualified tester on a computer system to find security weaknesses that will enable the tester to gain access to the functionality of the system and the data which is being processed on the system and so you should be conducting testing both because NYDFS says you should if you're a GDPR covered entity, GDPR says you need to be doing it, uh, you need to uh, avoid having to report a data breach, all of that as you know can lead to uh, uh, instant 
uh, uh, class action lawsuits uh, against officers, against the entity itself. Uh, and so penetration testing is another way of the organization providing some assurance to stakeholders, including board members, that the defenses the organization has in place are appropriate and are effective in penetration, pen in testing, in protecting the organization. Why do you need to repeat vulnerability tests and scans? Why do you need to do them scans biannually? Why do you need to repeat a, report, repeat a penetration test every year? Uh, the answer is because vulnerabilities change. Uh, new vulnerabilities are identified. Uh, really complex software that organizations deploy uh, means that sooner or later there will be a new way that an attacker has found of exploiting the complex code that's written. Nobody writes code with vulnerabilities in it. It's simply the complexity and the way code is used means that sooner or later somebody will find a way of breaking it and getting in behind it. The reality, the practical reality from a cybersecurity point of view is that biannual testing and annual penetration testing is not enough. Uh, if you were seeking to be PCI compliant, and again, the number of you will have PCI compliance either on your agenda or will be already PCI compliant, you know that you have to be doing vulnerability scanning of uh, the PCI cardholder data environment on at least a quarterly basis, not an annual, not a biannual basis. Uh, if you're doing penetration testing, uh, you need to be doing that internally and externally more often than a year. Nevertheless, uh, doing it at least a year is a is a minimum. Uh, most cases, organizations don't know they've been breached until it's too late. Most of the anatomies of major cyber attacks demonstrate that attackers were inside the organization up to a year beforehand. There'd been minor breaches which had been not discovered or not reported. Uh, and the accumulation of those in the end told the hackers that uh, there was uh, an opportunity for them to break in because nobody was really paying attention. Uh, the uh, FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, was accused last year of covering up data breaches that went back to uh, 2010, 2011, and 2013. Uh, in each case, the accusation was that uh, uh, FDIC's computers had been compromised by attackers uh, operating under the auspices of the Chinese government. And that, of course, is a key part. You're not just worrying about the uh, potential of uh, attackers who simply want to steal data, you've got competitors, and you've got foreign nation states, all of whom are interested in uh, making inroads into your data and into your defenses. Penetration testing really goes through three stages. The purpose of penetration tests are to um, evaluate an organization's ability to protect its networks, to identify where there are exploitable security threats and to prioritize uh, remediation, particularly uh, defensive remediation, not just patching, but where uh, attackers might be able to get through more than one level of defense, working out how you can uh, deal with those. And the practical reality is if you think about penetration testing as being a process of evaluating, identifying, and prioritizing, uh, it also is really useful in helping the organization communicate uh, around where its key security vulnerabilities are, what its priorities in uh, risk management are, uh, what the need for security budget is. Uh, a good set of penetration testing data will uh, form part typically of the budget planning for the next year, uh, a, an identification of known vulnerabilities, of upcoming vulnerabilities and operating systems. All of that typically should form part of the budget justification for the upcoming year's uh, financial uh, components of the cybersecurity budget. Identifying Vulnerabilities, identifying weaknesses in your security should enable you to protect profits, protect the company's reputation because you can avoid the financial costs and negative publicity with a, uh, associated with a compromised system. Almost every entity that suffers a significant data breach sees major downturns in uh, quarterly and sometimes annual earnings, can take a number of years to recover in terms of financial earnings, quite often sees uh, officers being forced to resign or stand down or uh, even be terminated. And prioritizing your 
uh, remediation and defensive activity means that you improve the likelihood of complying with uh, the whole range of regulations that uh, you need to comply with, helps you uh, comply also with uh, requirements around the NYDFS and uh, um, other uh, relevant data protection regimes and the broad range of uh, US regulation, uh, um, not least around the obligations on officers to take appropriate actions, non-negligent actions to protect personal data. So how does a penetration test work? Well, penetration tests typically are looking at a number of attack surfaces. Uh, they're looking at the uh, surface that users can see, uh, the basic internet facing uh, website. Uh, what can we do on a website? What kinds of exploits are possible? They look at the application. So if we get into the website, we look at what the application enables us to do. Uh, once we've got a username and account, how much further can we go? What can we attack inside the application? And if we can get through the application or we can get through the environment within which the application is hosted, we can maybe even get through to the, uh, the network and we can find out uh, uh, what data is running on the network. We can get beyond the website or beyond the internet facing uh, uh, internet connectivity to look at what's going on on the actual network and access databases on the network itself. So you need to be testing the network layer, the application layer and the user layer. You need to be testing publicly, publicly accessible systems. You should prioritize high risk systems, the systems in which you've got high value uh, non-public data or you've got uh, money or you've got information relating to financial accounts, all of the high risk systems, the systems on which the entity depends for its survival, prioritize defending and testing those. Uh, high value systems, the ones on which uh, your core business processing uh, depends. If an attacker wanted to compromise your operations, which systems would they want to take down for a day, a week, a month? Uh, the, uh, because if you can't operate, you can't operate, you lose customers, uh, your internal systems. And of course, uh, uh, the kind of testing that this does enables you to think about how you can segment both internally and externally so that if you lose one system, you don't lose them all. You should think of segmentation in the way uh, in a submarine, for instance, uh, they have uh, different areas segmented. So if you have a hole in one part of the submarine, the whole of the submarine isn't flooded. Uh, you can close off different areas. You can block out uh, parts of areas of submarines. The same thing applies to uh, cybersecurity defense you need to, if you're penetrated, be able to segment and contain an attack in just one part of the entity uh, network rather than having it spread right the way through the organization. And penetration testing comes in the form of both internal and external testing. Internal uh, attacks are looking at what a malicious insider might do. Uh, external uh, simulation is looking at what an outside attacker might do, how they might gain access to uh, what the organization is doing. In 2016, the New York Times reported the FBI uh, had arrested a, an NSA contractor for stealing and sharing highly classified computer code developed by the NSA to hack into the networks of foreign governments. And that computer code is being used right now, uh, folks, by hackers to break back into uh, not just uh, NSA systems, but systems of entities around the world. In 2015, an FDIC employee copied personally identifiable information of some 40,000 individuals and exposed that externally. Uh, there is uh, every day uh, in every part of the world uh, stories similar to these about internal uh, compromises uh, as well as external compromises. And the problem is that uh, you as an entity have to be successful against every single attack. The attacker only ever has to be successful once and you're in trouble. So how do you go about arranging a penetration test? Obviously, the first thing to do is to select a penetration testing supplier. Uh, you want to use an organization that's got an appropriate accreditation. Uh, there are, of course, organizations out there who will tell you they provide penetration testing services, but uh, they've never been themselves tested or accredited. They don't belong to any appropriate uh, industry uh, bodies. One of the industry bodies is uh, is CREST, C-R-E-S-T, um, uh, and it's probably one of the only global uh, accreditation authorities. So look for a supplier who's got some uh, uh, 
external accreditations, who's got a reputation for delivering consistent and high quality penetration tests, scope out with them what the engagement might look like, make sure you can understand the report. A good penetration testing company should be able to send you examples of what a report might look like. Um, and then the test, once it's carried out, is going to be able to produce a whole set of uh, reports. This is the kind of, you see on the screen, some of the uh, supporting information that a uh, a penetration test report will, uh, will will produce. It'll say these are the kinds of things we tested. It'll tell you whether we're able to get through or not. Uh, and from a detailed report, you can identify what the remediation should look like. And the report itself should tell you how to remediate. It shouldn't go, here's a set of vulnerabilities, good luck. It should say, here's the vulnerabilities, this is what you need to do to remediate. Really, there are two kinds of attack and therefore two kinds of penetration test. Uh, we call them a level one and a level two. Uh, level one penetration test is really a significant step on from a vulnerability scan. Uh, it's about looking for vulnerabilities. It's about testing for uh, false positives. Uh, it's making sure that all of your day-to-day -day systems are safe tested, that you've got good remediation advice, and that you can defend yourself against what's really 80 to 90% of all internet-borne attacks. A level two attack, a level two uh, penetration test, therefore, is dealing with uh, much more complicated attacks, which a comp competent attacker working uh, with both automated and manual tools would be able to execute. Uh, they would be looking to combine attack mechanisms. They'd be looking to break through uh, where they can find a weakness in one system and link it to a weakness in another system and get through into your network using quite sophisticated tools. And a Level two penetration test, you probably don't need to carry out as often as a level one. A level one is a monthly or a quarterly penetration test. Uh, we as an organization, for instance, we supply uh, cybersecurity services. We think we're a target. We do level one penetration tests uh, every month. We do level two penetration tests every uh, quarter uh, on our own network. We're not a financial sector organization. We think significant financial sector organizations should be thinking about that kind of frequency, even though the NYDFS says you don't need to do it quite as frequently as that. So vulnerability scans, typically automated. Uh, there might be a client scoping exercise, simply a conversation about which IP addresses do you want scanned. Uh, the scanning can be done both internally and externally. It's going to tell you uh, what the potential vulnerabilities are and the security loopholes are. And typically, you'll get a scan report immediately. Um, it won't usually give you any real guidance on remediation. Uh, because uh, uh, remediation requires thought. Level one penetration test will, uh, on the other hand, identify configuration vulnerabilities. It will give you good advice on remediation. Uh, and a level two uh, penetration test will give you a full and detailed penetration test of uh, all of the aspects of your uh, network. Level one penetration test will include some manual scanning and testing. Uh, a level two penetration test will include exploitation of vulnerabilities to establish potential impact of attack. And we'll look at some of the ways in which a, a series of uh, linked attacks might be uh, exercised to break into the network. So, uh, as I said, in looking at a penetration tester, you want to look for their reputation, uh, their ethics, what kind of background and financial record do they have? Um, are they uh, a recognized, industry recognized uh, organization? The uh, open uh, web, uh, uh, web application security um, uh, group is one of the organizations that provides guidance on what internet, what, what network and, and application testing should look like. And so you want to be able to look at a penetration test to see evidence of work they've done in the past. Have they got independent feedback on the quality of work performed? Do they adhere to a code of conduct? When scoping a penetration test, you want to be sure that your uh, testing organization is going to be able to meet your requirements. They meet your uh, compliance requirements. Uh, do they know why you want to or need to do penetration tests? Can they give you a set of results which are appropriate to your requirements? Uh, how are you going to use those requirements? Are they going to be detailed? report that you're going to use for mediation or a summary report that's going to be part of your assurance and governance regime? Is it internal or external? Do they understand which systems they're testing? Is it uh, critical or high profile systems? Are we looking at infrastructure applications? We're we looking at uh, second or third level 
administrator access testing. All of that should be part of the questions which your provider should ask. And of course, your penetration testing provider doesn't need to be in the building next to you. Most attacks are carried out from abroad, uh, so you can deal with penetration testing organizations anywhere uh, in, the, in the world. Third party permissions may be required typically if your uh, organization hosts data in a third party data center or in a cloud service provider. You'll, uh, part of your hosting agreement with them is that they'll be happy for you to have independent penetration tests carried out, but they'll want uh, your, you or your penetration tests to go through a, um, a permission process which enables them to identify the penetration test as being a genuine tester rather than a, an attacker. If it's an attacker, they'll tend to uh, block it. Um, they will uh, potentially take action against you for having uh, attacked their systems without authorization. Remember, a penetration testing a test is an authorized attack on a computer system. So your hosting organizations will want to know that you're planning to do the test and to give permission for it. So you should get in a penetration test, either a level one or a level two, a detailed report on the vulnerabilities, uh, a good explanation of what the reports are so that you can understand it and describe those to senior management, a summary in business risk terms of what you need to be doing with some short-term tactical recommendations and some longer-term strategic or root cause recommendations. Uh, ideally, you want a security improvement plan. Uh, this is how perhaps you should be prioritizing remediation uh, and an organization should be able to provide assistance in implementing security improvements. You won't necessarily want that, but an organization should be able to help you do that. Certainly, the findings that come out of the penetration test should be in an agreed format, should describe the finding both in technical terms that enable you to uh, deal technically with remediation, but also in non-business technical terms so you can see what uh, risks you've closed down, uh, what the actual justification from a business point of view is in your corrective action. So a good testing narrative, good evidence of testing and the identification of technical risks and how to address them should all be part of the uh, more detailed report findings, typically in um, annexes or appendices. We've talked in previous webinars about how ISO 27001, ISO 27001 can help you meet your NYDFS compliance requirements. Uh, and ISO 27001, as you know, has a requirement for a risk assessment that's helpful for NYDFS. It has a requirement for ongoing testing. Uh, your risk assessment will identify the need for testing. And so uh, ISO 27001 gives you a structured approach which will include a risk assessment, a risk treatment plan, uh, and part of continual improvement, all of which will include penetration testing. And ISO 27001, uh, as you may remember, and if you don't, just a brief reminder, it's internationally recognized best practice standard for cybersecurity or information security management. There's now a substantial ecosystem of uh, implementers. There's a substantial ecosystem of uh, practitioners who understand it. The United States, for instance, is a practitioner conference in Washington in October for ISO 27001 practitioners. A uh, number of companies have implemented it. It's growing very uh, quickly, particularly in the legal and financial sectors, the New York, because it's a, a financial and legal sectors across the United States, because it's an effective mechanism for demonstrating that you've taken appropriate steps to meet your compliance obligations. It's good, provides a good balance of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, and you can get an external certification from a registered auditor, um, which you can use as part of the demonstration to stakeholders and to others that you've done what you needed to be doing. ISO 27001, as I said, is a management system, has a list of 114 controls that are appropriate for dealing with the broad range of risks to non-public data that entities might hold. Amongst those controls, as well as cybersecurity, um, uh, um, InfoSec incident management and so on, uh, human resources security. And really, I want to just turn now to the second area that we're going to talk about tonight, which is employee training and monitoring, the section 500 point or dot 114 requirement that every covered entity must, as part of its cybersecurity program, implement risk-based policies, procedures, and controls to monitor the activity of authorized uh, individual users inside the organization to detect unauthorized 
requires access to non-public information by any such authorized users. And uh, as part of uh, implementing policies and procedures, you have to provide regular cybersecurity awareness training for all personnel and that that's kept update to reflect uh, risks. And typically organizations are going to provide training and awareness in some uh, online format. That The most cost-effective format is also the way in which you can best demonstrate that all staff in scope, all employees in scope have actually carried out the necessary training because you can log attendance, you can have them uh, do a course exam or test that demonstrates that they've understood what you needed to. ISO 27001 helps in that. It has a couple of controls that say people working within the ISMS must be aware of the information security policy, understanding their contribution to it and the implications of non-conformance. And 7.2.2 says that uh, user education and training should be proportionate to the role. Management support is critical to effective uh, cybersecurity training. If management itself is seen to be carrying out the requirements set by the cybersecurity program, there's a much greater possibility that everybody else will be uh, doing so. If top management uh, thinks it's exempt, many people inside the organization will think that they're exempt. Your cybersecurity training program should cover all of the areas in which there are typical vulnerabilities in the human attack surface, password use and protection, uh, the recognition and deployment of antivirus software, anti-malware software, uh, behaviors on the internet that protect the organization against the deployment of malware, email use, uh, how to protect confidential information, uh, physical access to the building, to the offices, uh, network accesses, including modem use, connection from home, the use of mobile devices to connect into uh, non-public uh, data, incident reporting, and above all, uh, social engineering. Social engineering is the exploiting of human uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and because it's increasingly difficult to exploit technical vulnerabilities, uh, the and it's even increasingly difficult to exploit technical vulnerabilities and as your penetration testing program gets better and better and better and you close out all of the technical vulnerabilities that you identify and you stay on top of them. So increasingly attackers turn to uh, social engineering, exploiting weaknesses in human beings. And the weaknesses include the tendency of people to follow instructions. So an instruction like, uh, this is your chief executive, I need you to transfer $10,000 to, or $10 million to this new supplier. Um, please set that up and execute the transfer within the next hour. That's an instruction. If you don't really know who the chief executive is, is you might fall foul of it, uh, and quite a high percentage of organizations have indeed fallen foul of exactly that. So uh, following instructions, ignorance, uh, gullibility, uh, desire to be liked, uh, desire to be helpful, please just hold the door for me, I've got too many files, I'll drop my coffee, I left my pass at my desk, uh, and people will hold the door for the hacker who uh, thereby has gained access to a secure part of the the building. So training staff in how to deal with, recognize and deal with those kind of attacks is a key part of meeting your obligations under NYDFS. And building uh, a threat aware culture across the whole of the entity, uh, which uh, rewards integrity and personal reliability, that has a, an effective acceptable use policy around governance governing of IT resources, it creates a safe environment in which staff are able to operate uh, safely where security incidents will be reported without a fear of consequences, which you really do need to have. People need to be able to identify an incident so that you can close it down. And that should enable you to build a multidisciplinary program that uh, detects, prevents, deters, responds to threats, limits their impact, that enables you to ensure that controls that you roll out across the organization are effective, that your vulnerability and patch management and internal network segmentation is up to date. You know the uh, set of breaches that spread their way across the world a month or so ago uh, took advantage of the ransomware breach, took advantage of the fact that many organizations were using unpatched uh, and out of support versions of Windows XP, uh, you shouldn't be. There isn't a financial justification really for using a piece of software which is out of support because it's out of support and therefore very easily able to be hacked uh, as has been demonstrated on multiple occasions. So 
testing an action plan for reacting to insider misbehavior, for reacting to security incidents, uh, making sure that you can uh, develop and improve on all of those processes as part of building an effective cybersecurity culture. Yes, you need to have really good policies, procedures, and controls deployed across the organization. And those include uh, good user access management, uh, perhaps role-based user access management, not enough just to have multi-factor authentication. You need to make sure that access to data is on an individual basis. You can't have multiple people accessing the same piece of information using the same username or password. It needs to be individualized. Uh, don't have uh, system administrator user accounts used for non-administrator activities, restrict special privileges to limited number of authorized individuals, don't allow unauthorized uh, users to access data on applications, just make sure that you implement exactly what it is that your cybersecurity program says you should do, test that it's working, train staff to uh, identify incidents and train staff to report things that need to be reported. So a staff awareness program uh, using training tools, thought-provoking activities, you can raise staff awareness of the cyber risks that your staff face both in the workplace and at home. And you should extend cybersecurity training uh, beyond the walls of the enterprise to deal with what's going on at home. Should start really when people join the organization, should be extended all the way through and should be updated whenever there is a new cybersecurity incident. This kind of training, uh, it's part of the requirements for GDPR, for PCI DSS, for ISO 27001, for HIPAA, for GLBA, all of it's necessary. All of it is part of making sure that you don't have a data breach to report, that officers are able to observe their um, non-negligence requirements because staff understand the consequences of poor information security and what to do and how to follow uh, the requirements consistently. There's a lot of resources that, uh, as an organization, we make available on itgovernanceusa.com. There's a data sheet on penetration testing. There's information on ISO, uh, ISO 27001 and how you can use it to meet the NYDFS requirements. There's some white papers just on NYDFS. Uh, all of that's available on our IT Governance USA uh, web, web shop. Uh, we've got penetration testing packages and staff awareness uh, training products that you can uh, uh, purchase through itgovernanceusa.com and deploy uh, across your uh, uh, operations in New York and anywhere else for that matter in uh, the uh, US. We're a trusted uh, accredited provider of all of those kinds of services. And of course, our penetration testing is designed to meet the level one, level two types of requirements that uh, we've been talking about. We've touched on e-learning courses. You can deploy them uh, in our cloud environment. You can deploy them in your own organizational environments. Uh, they're priced so that you can buy in large volumes or small as the case may be, um, but they are capable of delivering in uh, 40 minutes worth of training the key messages that you need, and they're capable of being customized in terms of um, the core customization or tailored customization that you might want. And the pricing for that is all fairly practical. In the much broader range of resources, online training, documentation, toolkit, risk assessment software, and of course ISO 27001, copies of the standard itself. And that brings me to the end of what I was planning to say. Um, I know we're very close to the planned end of this webinar, but uh, let me just address any uh, questions that we've got time to. Um, what we'll do is if there are questions we don't have time to address, we'll uh, deal with them afterwards and we'll send them out to um, everybody between uh, everybody who's booked onto the uh, webinar. What's the ideal or suggested order between risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, and penetration testing for the first time in the organization and thereafter? Um, the simple answer is uh, do your risk assessment first. Identify the uh, assets that you need to be protecting, the assets where if they're breached, you're going to have the biggest impact on the organization. Uh, carry out a, a vulnerability assessment. That's the lower cost option. Uh, first, uh, remediate, fix the vulnerabilities that are identified, then carry out a more extensive penetration test uh, on the organization. Penetration testing is uh, more extensive and more expensive. Uh, you don't want it finding uh, vulnerabilities in areas that you don't care about or finding vulnerabilities that you could have identified for less money. So that's the order, risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing. 
what's the uh, important factor in selecting third-party companies for testing? As do you recommend we change company after a few years? The uh, critical thing is choosing a company who understands your requirements and who keeps their testing up to date. There's no real value in changing testing companies uh, every three years. Testing companies, if you've chosen uh, correctly in the first case, are going to be uh, organizations who update their methodologies, uh, who are testing consistently for known vulnerabilities, who are up to date with what's going on. Uh, and actually, if you are using an organization which really has an awareness of what your business is, they should be able to deliver reports which you're able to make sense of much more quickly um, uh, than you can if you keep on changing provider. If your current provider isn't giving you something that you can use effectively, then by all means change, find somebody who does. But frankly, there is no real benefit uh, in changing uh, provider. Our experience is that uh, it's the penetration testing companies who don't have anything unique to offer who say, hey, change provider every three years because they hope that sooner or later you'll get around to come and deal with them. The reality is if you're dealing with a penetration testing company who've got something valuable to add, um, they will go on giving you useful and valuable uh, services. We're really running out of time. Um, yeah, uh, you've uh, one one of you saying, seen many penetration testing reports that did not explain the findings in sufficient details for in-house staff to recreate. Uh, yes, that's absolutely the case. So findings should be explained by reference to uh, CVE database, should provide the CVE risk ranking, uh, should tell you what it is. Uh, and because it's a CVE ranking, you should be able to go straight to the authoritative data, which is the most recent data there is on that um, uh, that vulnerability. And you should be able to understand exactly what it is. Frankly, people are telling you vulnerabilities that don't relate to a CVE uh, ranking uh, are likely pushing their luck, uh, they're making up maybe what the vulnerability is. Um, if they found something which is so new that it doesn't yet have a CVE ranking, um, then you should be interested in uh, asking them how they uh, found out about that. But typically a good penetration testing report is going to give you uh, CVE rankings for everything that you've got. Uh, folks, we're right out of time. This webinar is due to finish uh, uh, right now at uh, 2 p.m. So we'll parcel up uh, answers to uh, these questions, any others that we've got, we'll make those available uh, to all of you. I'd like to thank you all for being on this webinar this afternoon. There is an ongoing series of webinars around uh, NYDFS. We'll be continuing to provide uh, free information and support. Uh, we hope that you'll turn to us for some part of the products and services that we can provide to help you get cost effectively compliant. Uh, we are never going to be doing anything other than helping you do this in the way that's most uh, cost effective and practical for you and for your organization. And of course, we're going to be doing it from the perspective of ISO 27001 or ISO 27001, knowing that that's a method, a methodology that enables you to tick, tick off compliance to more than one set of compliance requirements at a time. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I wish you a very good uh, afternoon. Have a good day.